Okay. Okay. Glad you could be here with us today. If you're, I see a lot of new faces out there today, and if you're just joining us, we had a lovely snow day last Sunday, and I hope you all were able to enjoy it and get some sleep, because I know that you all, Sundays are hard work for you guys, so hope you enjoyed the Sunday off there. We are um, nearing the end of a series that we started um, last month called Deal or, Deal or No Deal, and I assume that everyone here is probably familiar with the television show, and the premise of the show is very similar to the premise of this series, but just with a little bit of a twist. The show is all about a bunch of briefcases, and you get to choose and try to find the one that has the million dollars inside of it. And we also are going through some different briefcases, but our briefcase had nothing to do with money as much as it has to do with the greater prize, which what we're looking for is the New Testament church. We said in the very beginning of this series, and I said it every week since then, is that in the very, very beginning, when Christ was on this earth, after he left, he left a church, okay? It wasn't, um, uh, he didn't just leave a bunch of people to do nothing. He left a church, and he instituted the church. And what we're looking for is to find out where that church is today. So we've been kind of looking at all the different aspects of that New Testament church. And what we've seen is that the New Testament church is, in fact, the Orthodox church or I should say the Orthodox Church is, in fact, the New Testament Church, and we've seen it on many different levels. The topic that we're going to look at today is something that I've actually mentioned every week in this series, but I haven't covered in detail. And the topic that we're going to cover today, it's like, it's one of the foundational things, and in hindsight, I wish I had covered it earlier because I see that it caused a lot of questions. What we're going to talk about today is the T word. Do you know what the T word is? Okay, the T word is a word that most evangelical and Protestant Christians hate this word. And if people got beef against the Orthodox Church, then the big word that they don't want to hear mentioned is, don't throw tomatoes at me when I say it or something like that, T word is tradition. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm telling you, this is one of the most hated words in a lot of Christian circles today. But realize that it is a hated word with good cause. Because back in the 15 and 1600s and in that time period there, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, right before the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church did some funny stuff and some corrupt practices, and most of them were, like, assigned under the category of tradition. So they got away with some different funny businesses. Like, you know, that whole, um, we talked about last time about the whole... Um, I think we talked about the Immaculate Conception stuff. Then we talked about, like, infallibility of the Pope a couple sessions before that. And then they had that whole indulgences stuff. So all those wrong teachings, which are wrong, 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 okay, were labeled or were put under the label of tradition. So for that reason, a lot of people don't want to have nothing to do with tradition. What we want to look at today is, what does the Bible have to say about tradition? Look here. Most of the time, we think that it's Bible or tradition. Okay, that you can't accept both. You can't accept Bible and tradition. I will tell you that in fact, that it's not Bible or tradition, it is Bible and tradition, and you cannot accept one without the other. You can't have the Bible without tradition, and you can't have tradition without the Bible. The two are like sisters that are joined together, and we'll see that together. It's no doubt that the Bible has lots to say about the subject of tradition. Some stuff which appears negative, and some stuff which appears positive. Let's start with the negative. No one was more against tradition and spoke out more strongly against it than our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 7, verse 8 and 13. It says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Speaking out very strongly, and he's scolding the Pharisees for the way that they taught the traditions of men. Another verse, St. Paul also spoke about tradition in a negative light when he said in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So there's two passages which are on the negative side of tradition. 
Don't go with tradition. On the flip side, there's some verses that speak positively for it. Those should be in your handout. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Another one, St. Paul says, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. My question to you. I just showed you four verses. Two pro, two con. Doesn't it seem like the Bible is contradicting itself? Because some verses say, don't have nothing to do with tradition. And then some verses say, make sure you follow our tradition. And then some verses say that if you follow tradition, it's empty deceit. Another one says that anyone who doesn't follow tradition, don't go near that person. Is the Bible contradicting itself? Obviously, the answer is no. The key is in realizing that when the Bible speaks about tradition, there's two kinds of tradition. And the, and the first kind is tradition, and the second kind is tradition. One with a capital T, one with a little t. Capital T tradition is what we call the holy tradition. Okay, and little t tradition is like culture. Okay, another way of looking at it is little t tradition is like the tradition of men. And big T tradition is the tradition of God. So when the Bible speaks against tradition, it 100% speaks against the tradition of men being taught as tradition of God. It's not against tradition of men. You can't be against tradition of men because every man has traditions. Your family does something on Thanksgiving and your family does something on Easter and Christmas. That's not wrong and it's not her heretical to get together at Tunt Lulu's house or whatever for Thanksgiving. That's not wrong. What is wrong is if you teach that tradition as of God and you teach that of the holy tradition. That's what's wrong. See what I'm saying? So tradition is not bad. Teaching customs or culture as holy tradition is what's wrong. Like some people, I was just talking to someone this past week, saying it's hard for him to look at the Orthodox Church when we do things that are just so clearly cultural. Like there's just some things inside us that are ingrained in our culture and he can't accept that. Look here. Every church has culture, okay? It's not wrong, okay? We speak the language that we speak. We use the instruments that we use. That's just part of who we are. It doesn't, but it is wrong if I stood here and says, unless you speak Arabic, then you are a sinner. Yes, that's wrong if I'm teaching the tradition of men as a tradition of God. That's not what the Orthodox Church is doing. So you have to understand the distinction between these two. Because in the church today, we have both of them. Let's play a little game so you understand the tradition of men versus the tradition of God. I'll give you some examples, things that you'll find in the church, in this church, here and now today, and you guess. Let's call it culture or tradition of God. Okay? Let's start with the first one. Liturgy begins at 9.30, as you know. So the majority of the people, not say majority, but it's a good number, arrive 45 minutes late and still consider themselves being on time. Tradition or culture? Culture. Very good. You guys are doing good. One for one. Very good. Okay, let's move right along here. Men on the left, women on the right. When you walk into the Orthodox Church, if you walk for the first time, you'll see the majority of the men sit on the left and the majority of the women sit on the right. Sometimes there's some, you know, people who go back and forth between them, but the majority is that way. Tradition or culture? Culture. Very good. Nowhere in the church doctrine does it say that the men have to sit on the left and if they go near the right side, they will be smite us down or something like that. <laughs> it's a cultural thing. We're churches from the Middle East. In the Middle East, men and women sit like... Middle East is not the most gender-friendly um, <laughs> place. Let me put it that way. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with sitting separate or sitting together. In the same way we don't teach sitting separate as tradition, we can't teach sitting together as tradition either. Each one does what they or she feel like. My parents, who have been going to church for however many decades they've been going to, I don't care how much you tell him this and that, my dad's always going to sit on the left, mom's going to sit on the right. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also nothing wrong with mixing. Facing east. Anytime we pray in the church, unto the east look. And our church is always facing the east. Culture or tradition? Very good. Tradition. You guys are on the ball. Won't get too much into detail on this, but especially in the Old Testament, there's a couple verses that talk about the throne of God is to the east. And another spiritual way that you can kind of look at, like the sun rises in the east, and we look at the, 
at the, at, as Christ is like the light of the world. So we always pray towards that east. Things like that. This is a little bit more complicated one, which I can go into detail, but I won't for the sake of time. But it is the tradition of the church. Okay, another one. Okay. Um, saying El or Yani between every word. Culture or tradition? Definitely culture. Definitely culture. Okay, that's an easy one. Okay. Fasting two-thirds of the year. Almost. Very good. Tradition. You'll notice in the very earliest books of the early church fathers, like there's a book called the Didache, which is the teaching of the 12 apostles. You would be shocked. I was shocked to read that in there it says about fasting without fish every Wednesday and Friday. And the writings of the 12 apostles. So don't give me Baba Carolus this and I love this and that and that. The early church said from the beginning about fasting. Okay, next one. Giving your daughter her father's first name as her middle name, no matter how funny it sounds, like Atif or Rauf or Neshet. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely culture. <laughs> All right, I think we got one last one right here. Men kissing men. <laughs> totally unnecessary is what that is. <laughs> Let's get that off the screen quickly. Okay, very good. So as you can see, in the church today, you're going to walk in, and you're going to see different kinds of tradition that are taking place. If we go back to what St. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, you'll see that here he's speaking about the tradition, not culture, okay? And he says that the source of the tradition, there's two places that it comes from. He says... Stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word, verbal, or by our epistle, which is written. So you know what this verse teaches? Epistle we understand. Do the things that you are taught that are written down. But what's the first part? What's the word part? The verbal part? That's tradition. That's the church's tradition. What he's saying right here is that there's some stuff that you should do that's in the Bible, and there's some stuff that isn't in the Bible. That's hard for some of us to accept. That's hard for some people to accept. Because that's really counter to what a lot of us are taught, which is that the Bible has everything that you will ever, 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 ever possibly need. That would be true if Christianity was a teaching and it was about knowledge. That would be true. But Christianity is not teaching. Christianity is life. Okay? Christianity is a life that is to be lived. When our Lord Jesus Christ was on this earth, okay, he didn't write down a thing. He didn't write down a thing. Only one time he wrote in the sand, and no one even knows what it is that he wrote. So if you're limiting the revelation of God to just what is written, then you are excluding everything that our Lord Jesus Christ taught. It wasn't written down. <clears throat> Logically, it doesn't make sense that the only things that he taught are written in the Bible. It just doesn't make sense that way. For example, we believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Find me a verse. There are many verses that refer to the Trinity. Find me a verse that says explicitly that when you pray, you pray to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Find me a verse in the Bible that says when you pray, make sure it's on Sunday, that's the day of the Lord. Because the Old Testament said Saturday. Sabbath day, the seventh day. Find me a verse that says that. It's not written down anywhere. Find me a verse like the creed that we all believe in, that we say, and that the majority of Christian churches accept the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Punta Quartura, created heaven and earth. Find me where that's written. It's not. So there's lots of things that we know to be true that we have inside the church which aren't written in the Bible. Why? Because Christianity is not a teaching. Christianity is a life. And a life cannot be handed down in pen and paper, in pen and ink, or paper and ink. Do you know what the word tradition <clears throat> means? I think I put it, did I put it in your handout? Maybe not. The word tradition that's coming to us here literally means handing down orally, orally, of customs, beliefs, stories, etc., etc., from generation to generation. That's the dictionary's definition of what I'm sorry, not the dictionary. That's the, the Greek word that's translated into tradition. That's what it means. 
And the word that's, signif er, the word that's used... Actually, no, I'm sorry. This is the dictionary definition. This is uh, Webster's Dictionary. The biblical word that's used and translated into tradition is a word that signifies a passing on of a baton. Okay? That's what it means. It means a passing on of a stick from one guy to the next. That's what Christianity is. It's I have this baton and I give it to the next guy. What I'm saying is there's more than just what, what was written. And we'll get into the details of all that kind of stuff. But this is why the concept of apostolic succession is so important in the Orthodox Church. In, in any Christian church. It's so important that the baton that I give to you is simply the baton that I was given by the guy before me. But it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous for each one to kind of leave here, kind of Rambo style on their own, go find a baton, shine it up a little bit, and then cut a little piece off, and then add a little bit of that, and then start handing down to other people. That's very dangerous. Okay? And that's not what tradition is all about. Tradition is what I get, I give. And I have me as an Orthodox Christian, you have, as an Orthodox Christian, have no right to teach or believe anything unless it's what you were handed down. Okay? <clears throat> That's regarding the holy tradition. The cultural stuff, the tradition stuff, do what you want. Sit on the left, sit on the right, who cares? Okay? All that stuff doesn't matter. You want to kiss and not kiss? Uh, that stuff doesn't matter to me. But the point is that when it comes to the church tradition, that's where you have, you have no... Like, that's where we can only pass on what we've received. If you look at the end of our Lord Jesus Christ's life on this earth, right before he left, what did he tell his disciples? Matthew 28, verse 19. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't tell them, sit down and write everything that you know and distribute it around. He didn't tell them that. He said, you have everything. I've given you everything that you have or that, I, that I could give you. I put it all inside there. I gave you the Holy Spirit. Now go and teach the next guy. What if the next guy had said, you know what? I'm not going to buy what you're teaching to me unless I see it written in the Bible church wouldn't have gotten very far. The Bible itself wasn't even written for many years, okay? When these guys went out, you're like 30, 33, something like that. The Bible didn't come around until much, much later. Other examples of, new, of tradition in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. St. Paul says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. Not which I wrote to you, but the stuff that I taught you, hold on to that stuff. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 2, And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. St. Paul is saying, The stuff that I gave you in the baton, now give it to someone else. Commit it to someone else who is able to teach, not right, but able to teach others. One more verse, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Explain this verse to me if you don't believe in tradition. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is St. Paul's farewell speech, okay, before he leaves his disciples. And he tells them, after a long monologue, he says at the very end, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If you look throughout the Gospels, nowhere is this written in the Gospels. How did St. Paul know how to teach it? How did St. Paul teach it to others? Simple. Someone told him. The guys before him, the Peters and the Johns and the Jameses and the, those guys said one of the critical teachings that our Lord Jesus Christ always said is it is more blessed to give than to receive. And it's something that he received, the baton, and he handed the baton down to the next guy coming after him. If you don't buy tradition and you don't believe in tradition, I'll show you two verses in the Bible that you cannot explain. First one, John chapter 21 verse 25 says, and there are many other things, this is, that, this is the end of the Gospel of St. John, and there are many other, there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Last verse of the Bible, or of the, of the uh, Gospel of St. John. He wrote down everything that he could remember, and everything that he wanted to write about all the miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gets to the end and says, look here, man, my arm's getting tired, there aren't enough paper in the world for me to write down all the other stuff that he did. Does that mean that those other things that he did is insignificant or is worthless or is of no value? Absolutely not. I mean, 
It's illogical to say that. Another verse, one of the best verses in the Bible. Try to understand what this says. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of diseases and all kinds of, all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. You understand what that verse says? This is one verse in the Bible that talks about one day in the life of Christ. Christ had a public ministry of three years. This is referring to one day. And on this day, this is probably like the greatest day in the history of all mankind. This says that on this day, Christ went about all of Galilee. He taught in all their synagogues. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He healed all kinds of diseases and all kinds of sickness, all kinds of diseases. Imagine I told you that on, February, or on March 4th, Father Anthony went about all of Fairfax. He went teaching in all the churches and he preached the gospel of the kingdom, healed all kinds of sickness. Man, if I healed one sickness, I'd be in good shape. He had all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. That's one day. Tell me one thing. What did he say? What did he say? It must have been valuable. There's no way that he went around every single church in all of Fairfax and he didn't say anything important. There's no chance of that. But it's not written anywhere. Or is it written somewhere? It is written somewhere. In the church. It's written in the church. He wrote it in here. He wrote it in the hearts and in the lives of his disciples. The guy who followed him around and carried his shanta, his, his suitcase, everywhere that he went. Those guys are the guys who have, know what he said right here. And that's why we place very high value in what they teach us and what they wrote down and what they told their disciples and what their disciples told their disciples and what their disciples told their disciples who told their disciples who told Pope Snuda one day who told me another day. That's the apostolic succession. Because that stuff isn't written down in the Bible. Did you know that the New Testament, the Gospels, of the three years of Christ's life, you know how many days the New Testament, the Gospels cover? Eighteen. Eighteen out of the three years. Eighteen days out of the 1,095, 96 if it was a leap year, days that our Lord Jesus Christ went around teaching, preaching, healing, doing all kinds of stuff. 18 of the 1,095 days is accounted for in the gospel. And this is one of them. And this doesn't tell us anything. There's no way that the other 1,070 something or other days couldn't have been of any value. It just doesn't make sense. Tradition, the Bible gives us a lot. Tradition gives us the rest. Okay? And you can't, like... You can't look at the Bible without looking at your... That pesky banker calling back again. Let's see what he want. Hello? Hello. How can I trust that I'm being taught what Jesus taught? Mm. How do I know the traditions come from God, mm. not from men? How do I know the church isn't just feeding me man-made inventions? Good question. All right, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Good question. The principle of tradition is easy to understand. But how do I trust it? How can I trust the tradition that I'm receiving is coming really from God, not that cultural business? How can I trust that someone is going to come and tell me about the naming your, middle, your daughter's middle name, this and that, and say, no, you have to? How am I going to trust that someone's going to tell me, no, you have to on this side? And they could be giving me the traditions of men and teaching as the tradition of God. Isn't that what the Roman Catholic Church did? about indulgences, about immaculate conception, about purgatory, about papal infallibility, about all those things. How can I trust the tradition is coming from God? Well, <clears throat> that's a very, very good question, and I hope it's a question that every one of you is asking, and we're going to answer it together right now. Two things. First of all, realize that our trust is not in men, but our trust is in God. And what I trust is that the Holy Spirit will lead the church into the truth. I don't trust that man will always know the truth, but I trust that the Holy Spirit will always lead the church. Sometimes people will make mistakes, but the church is the body of Christ, and it's led by the Spirit, and it will always be led into the truth. It's not my words. It's what our Lord Jesus Christ said. John chapter 16 is a promise that Christ made. He said, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. 
Set aside your personal opinion of church history for one second here. Regardless of what you believe, on this day in time, our Lord Jesus Christ made a promise that the Holy Spirit will always lead the church into truth. Whether you believe that the church erred or not erred, leave that aside for a second. He promised it right here. So the truth of the matter is that yes, people err, and yes, people make mistakes, but the church never does because the church is not a human body. The church is a divine body. How can I say that? Look here. Even in the New Testament, people made mistakes. Didn't St. Peter make a mistake how he taught about the eating with the circumcised and not eating with the uncircumcised? Remember how he got himself in some trouble? And what happened when there was that little mistake that was made and St. Peter taught the wrong thing? Man made a mistake, so what did the church do? They gathered everyone together. They got all together. They discussed it. They came to the conclusion that was from God, not from men. And they all left teaching that thing. You see, we don't trust in individuals. We trust in the church as an ecumenical body. Use the big word. Ecumenical. Ecumenical means that when the church gets together, also like the word synod is another word that's used, when the church gets together, we trust that the Spirit will guide the decisions that are made. <clears throat> an individual may stray. When there's a question about a teaching or a doctrine or whatever, the church gathers everyone from all over the world. They get together and they discuss it. You know what the church does? The church doesn't go with like a Senate majority, okay? So it's not like a 60-40 a in favor of this and not that. It's either unanimous, it's either 100% or 0%. And they don't leave until it's that way. Because the Spirit of God can't be in favor of circumcision 60-40, okay? Or can't be in favor of this teaching 70-30. It can't be that way. Either it's truth or it's not truth. So in this ecumenical, the synod, council gets together, they sit, they discuss, they pray, and we trust that the Holy Spirit will lead the church as a body, not as individuals. It's a very good example of that that you can see very clearly. I told you guys before how the Orthodox Church is actually split into two families. The Eastern Orthodox, also called Chalcedonian, and then the Oriental Orthodox, also called non-Chalcedonian. And these two churches— these two entities or two like groups of churches split how many years ago? Anyone hey, remember? It's four, 451. So that's like a lot of years ago, 1,500 years, something, something like that, okay? And in those 1,500 years, what they discovered recently, okay, they started to get together and started to discuss all that kind of stuff. They discovered that their teachings, their doctrine, their beliefs, even after 1,500 years of not talking to each other, is exactly the same. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Look here. We make plans for lunch this afternoon. If we don't talk for 15 minutes, everyone has a different idea of what's going on. These people didn't talk for 1,500 years, and they came together and said, you know what? We both believe the same stuff. Don't believe me? Let me read you a quote here. Uh, read you a quote here. <laughs> okay. From the Joint Commission of Theological Dialogue. Okay, this is a statement that was written in 1990 when the talks first began to try to reunite the two entities. This is an exact quote I took from their website. In light of our agreed statement on Christology, as well as the above common affirmations, we have now clearly understood that both families have always loyally maintained the same authentic Orthodox Christological faith and the unbroken continuity of the apostolic tradition, though they have used Christological terms in different ways. Both families agree that all the anathemas and condemnations of the past, meaning that in the past, I didn't like you, you didn't like me, so I, I excommunicated you, you excommunicated me. They're saying that both the anathemas and condemnations of the past, which now divide us, should be lifted by the churches in order that the last obstacle to the full unity and communion of our two families can be removed by the grace and power of God. Both families agree that the lifting of anathemas and condemnations will be consummated on the basis that the councils and fathers previously anathemized and condemned are not heretical. Basically saying, I'm sorry to you, you're sorry to me, let's forgive each other, hug and kiss. But not the kissing, not that way. <laughs> Last thing, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. Trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Not trusting in themselves. Trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth, unity, and love, we submit this agreed statement and recommendations to our venerable churches for their consideration and action, praying that the same spirit would lead us to that unity for which our Lord 
prayed and praised. What you see there, first of all, if anyone's interested in this more, is a website it's called orthodoxunity.com. You can read, there's like 10,000 of these statements, okay? But the whole point of it is, they didn't talk for 1,500 years, have the same belief. How can that be? Easy. The Spirit is the one who's actually leading both the churches, okay? So we trust in the Holy Spirit who led the church. The second reason I trust the Holy Spirit to lead the church and preserve the tradition as God-made, not man-made, is because of the way we receive the Bible. You know, we all believe that the books of the Bible were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I trust in the Holy Spirit who not only wrote the Bible, but also compiled the Bible. What I mean by that is, you believe or you know to be true, it's not even a matter of belief, that every word of Scripture is inspired by God. But what I'm saying is, I trust not in God who wrote the Scripture, but I trust in God who compiled the Scripture. What do I mean by that? Look here. Old Testament, we know, has 39 books. New Testament has 27 books. There's the Deuterocanonical books. Leave those aside for right now. That's 66 books that everyone accepts as written in the Bible. Do you think there's only 66 spiritual books ever written? Do you think there's only four Gospels that were written? Do you think there's only 17 books of prophecy that were written, and, and that, those are the ones that were included in the Old Testament? There's hundreds of books of prophecy. There's many epistles. There's many Gospels that were written. But we know that most, not, I don't say most of them, but the, the ones that aren't in the Bible were not inspired by God. Well, I have a question for you. Who made that decision? Who made that decision that what you're reading and you accept as the Word of God to be really the Word of God? Who made the decision? Church. So if you don't trust the church for the Bible, then how are you not going to trust the church for the other stuff? Because the church is what gave you the Bible. What I'm saying is, when God wanted to write the Bible, He didn't like gather the people together and said, okay, Isaiah, you write 66 chapters and talk about this topic. And um, uh, Jeremiah, you talk about this topic and make it in this, like, this, this light. And Paul, you write these epistles. That's not the way it worked. They didn't divide it up and, and discuss the theme of each one. People wrote stuff, and then the church gathered them together, said, these are keepers, these are not. This one's inspired by God. This one's not inspired by God. There were many, many, many false writings, especially in the New Testament. Because it's just like people were just writing just because, you know, Christianity, you know, I mean, it's like the new fad. It was the new fad at times. That people were trying to cash in on the new cash cows. Like people do right now. Passion of Christ came out, and it was a moneymaker. So everyone wants to do something Christian. That's why you can find, like, Christian ways of losing weight, which is uh, somehow Christians lose weight different than other people. I don't know how. And Christian ways of, like, saving money for the future. I don't understand that kind of stuff. It's just people trying to cash in on the Christian stuff. How did we know which ones were in the Bible, or which ones were inspired by God, and which ones were the church? In the council setting. They got together. They said, no, this gospel, this one's no good. This gospel, this is good. You know when that happened? In the fourth century. For the first four centuries of Christianity. And I would argue the strongest centuries of Christianity, there was no Bible. Yeah, there was the Old Testament, but it wasn't compiled together as an Old Testament. Yeah, there was certain writings, but they weren't compiled together in a nice, neat book that you find in the hotel room everywhere you go. It wasn't compiled together until the 4th century. How did the church survive without the Bible? Simple. The church is the mother of the Bible. And you can't accept the Bible without accepting the church, without accepting tradition. To do so is dangerously close to trying to separate the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? To take the Bible without taking tradition is to divide the work of the Spirit and say, you know what, Holy Spirit? I like what you did here. You did a great job. I'm not convinced with your work over here. I still need to be convinced. It's a dangerous area that you're going into. Okay? So if you trust the church in discerning which books, then you should trust the church in discerning the rest of things. Whoa, Hello? whoa, Sorry. whoa, whoa. <laughs> that sounds very dangerous to me. You are giving a lot of power to people. What if they say something that contradicts the Bible or something just false? To me, tradition is way too risky. It opens the door for anyone to say anything and have it be doctrine. Good point. That's a good point. 
as much as I want to believe in the Spirit guiding the church, isn't it risky? Aren't I giving too much power to people? What if people say stuff that's against the Bible? Tradition is too risky, right? Look here, man. Tradition is in place to prevent exactly that. You're looking at it backwards. Tradition is not what you should be scared of. Tradition is the fence that keeps the church always in line with what God wants to teach. It's the baton. As long as I have the baton, I'm safe. I'm comfortable. I'm much more comfortable with someone giving me a baton that says on it, made in the year 33 AD, as opposed to someone giving me a nice new shiny one and saying, no, 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 trust me. This is the right one. Trust me. Okay? Tradition is actually there to prevent heresy because Orthodox tradition says that we believe what the church teaches us, nothing added, nothing subtracted. One of the problems, okay, again, I told you that the reason people have a problem with tradition is because back in the year 1054, I showed you this diagram before. Back in the year 1054, the Roman Catholic Church added to the faith, okay? They added to the creed, you know, and the, 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 it's a famous clause called the filioque, okay? You know, when we say the creed, the creed had been in place from the very beginning to either 1054, everyone said the same thing. Yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. 1054, the Catholic Church got it in its head, proceeds from the Father and the Son. Okay, that's what filioque literally means. It means and the Son. So they added something to the faith. That's why when I drew this split, I drew it as not going straight anymore. Because now it's not the same faith. Now it's something different. It's a new faith. It's a baton plus a little bow on the side. And the main problem with that is if you are able to add a little bow on this side, how about little pigtails on this side? And how about a little ribbon on this side? Like what's to stop me from adding more decorations and nice ornamental things? That's where the Catholic Church has gone in that direction. <clears throat> That's what led to the whole Reformation, okay, beginning in the year 1517 and continuing on to this day, which is people revolting against that. Now, some people added more. Some people took away more. Okay, it just, the, the scene became kind of um, crowded at that point in time. What I'm going to tell you right now is a hard truth, okay? And I, I'm saying this in total love, and not in judgment whatsoever. And I have many, many friends in the Catholic Church, and I went to Catholic school my life. Mother Teresa is great, Pope John Paul, all that kind of stuff. Nothing against the Catholic Church. But the truth of the matter, okay, the Catholic Church strayed by addition to the faith. Okay? That's not a, like, I'm not condemning them all to hell or anything like that. Okay? There's many great Catholics, but I'm saying a fact in a non-emotional, non-biased way. The Catholic Church strayed by adding to the faith. In the year 1054, they went away from the baton and they added something on top of it. So their faith today is no longer the same faith that was in the apostolic times um, of the St. Peter, St. Paul, and, and all those guys. But you know what hard truth number two is? Again, I say this with all love and no judgment. That as the Catholic Church strayed by addition, the Protestant Church strayed by subtraction. And you know what? Both are equally as bad. You're driving down the road. You see something, you swerve to the right. You realize you're going to run into a ditch. So what do you do? You turn back to the left. If you overcompensate, you'll end up in a ditch on the other side. Whether you went to the left or to the right, either way, you end up in a ditch. And that's unfortunately what's happened in the Protestant churches. It's equally as wrong to take away stuff as it is to add stuff. Catholic Church started adding stuff to the faith. Protestants, in an overcompensating move, try to revolt against it because they were rightly, like, harmed by this and they were in danger over here. They swung it too far this way. They go too much with St. Mary. Forget about St. Mary. Mary's a no-name, okay? They go too much with um, um, sacraments and liturgy and all this kind of stuff. We get rid of all sacraments, no sacraments, communion once a month, and it's just something that we kind of do just to kind of keep the ball rolling. Um... Doctrine is something that they started to change it. Now, no one can tell you what doctrine is. You believe what you want to believe. 
worship. They started doing it only in their language. No one could participate. Hey, you make it so that you make it the way you want it, okay? And don't let anyone tell you how to worship. Whether you end up in a ditch on this side or you end up in a ditch on this side, either way, you're in a ditch, okay? And either way, you're in trouble. Someone this past week sent me an email, okay? And it was talking about, um, about this whole thing about the Protestant, why the Protestants overcompensated. Um, and it was in, in reference to like our last discussion about St. Mary. So I, it was very enlightening to me, and I appreciated this person's email, so I wanted to share it. The person said, why do you get such a harsh reaction about Mary, as well as other issues, from Protestant people? The Catholic Church has left such a bad taste in the mouths of some believers that anything that remotely resembles Catholicism draws a reactionary response, overcompensating. This person described it in their own words. Imagine you had an aunt whose house you used to frequent, which smelled like delicious chocolate chip cookies every time you entered. The smell, by all human accounts, is so yummy. And nobody could argue with its goodness. However, every time you went to that house, you had a horrible experience. You were abused, taught bad things, almost missed life, and died. Thereafter, your normal human reaction to the smell of chocolate chip cookies would be a severe adverse reaction, no matter how often other people try to tell you that the smell is great and good. That this is how former Catholics feel when they smell incense or see the ornate decor of the Orthodox Church or even hear the word Mary in discussion. It is their normal reaction to the bad experience they had, regardless of the truth of the issues of incense, the reasons behind the decor, and theology of Mary. I like what this person said. They put it so eloquently, okay, that the reason why... I read a nice book that says the reason why that Protestants have such a tough time with some of the stuff that we're talking about, it's called Romophobia, okay? And it's fear of anything that looks like Rome, anything that looks Catholic, okay? And that's why when we talk about incense, talk about liturgy, talk about priests, some people get weirded out, okay? And they can't even get close to it. The person gave the example of cookies. In the end, if the smell has this effect on you, you lose because you miss the cookies, okay? And that's what I feel with the Orthodox Church. I understand why people feel this way, but still, I want to help them to see that there's something between ditch on the left and ditch on the right. And that something is in the middle, which is the Orthodox Church. So, kind of in summary, <clears throat> if you want to know what tradition is, tradition is Jude chapter 3, which says, Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. This is a verse that a lot of churches quote. But if you really understood what this verse said, this was written many, many, many years before Martin Luther, many, many years before 1054, many years before the ecumenical councils. It was written in the apostolic era. And it says, the faith has already been once delivered. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be subtracted. That's what tradition is. It's going back to that and holding on to it. Yeah, it may look old, may look rusty, may not have nice bells and whistles like some of the other batons around there, but it's the baton that Jesus gave to St. Peter, to St. Paul, St. James, St. John, all of those guys. And that's the baton that I want to hold on to. As we say in the liturgy, the Orthodox Church is, you may consider it bad, I consider it good. From generation to generation to the end of the ages, so, or it shall be from generation to generation to the end of the ages. Amen. <clears throat> That's the way Orthodox Christianity is. Something that's just passed on. Orthodox Christianity, and tradition specifically, is not against the Bible. But like I said, it is the mother of the Bible. And you can't have the Bible without having tradition. Let's look at it from another perspective. If all you had was the Bible, and you didn't have tradition, Aren't there many other non-Christian faiths which have the Bible that we have? For example, every now and then you get a knock, knock, knock on your door from the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have a Bible. It may not be the exact same translation as yours, but it's pretty similar. And they look at that Bible, and they look at it and say what many other people would say. No one can tell me how to interpret it. I interpret it how the Spirit teaches me how to interpret it. And they have a very bad interpretation of it. 
What's to say their interpretation is any better than yours? Any better than mine? See, it's my word versus his word. And to be honest, if all you had was the Bible and your own interpretation of it, then you know what? You and Jehovah's Witnesses, it's his word versus your word. That's where we need the tradition. If all you had was the Bible and you didn't have the tradition, which like I said, is the mother of the Bible and it fills in the gaps and it guides you in how to interpret it, you'd be lost, okay? You'd be in trouble. And believe it or not, the majority of the people who say they don't believe in tradition, you have to have some tradition. If you've never, if you've ever read one spiritual book and listened to what they told you, you've listened to the teachings of men. It's just a matter of, do you listen to the men who are in the year 33 or the year 40 or the year 1500 or the year 1054? You choose what era of men you're going to listen to. But the bottom line is, there's no such thing as anyone who just came out the wound and said, yes, I believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. There's no such thing. It's something that someone taught you at some point in time. The church is not against the Bible. Our tradition is not against the Bible. Tradition is the guardian of the truth. Or of truth. As St. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the church of the living God, the pillar of and the ground of the truth. I read a nice analogy that describes how the church and tradition and the Bible all work together. You're driving down the road. Speed limit is 35 miles an hour. You choose to drive 60 miles an hour. The laws of the state of Virginia in Fairfax County, whatever it may be, say that you, if you drive faster than the speed limit, you should get a ticket. But just because I have a piece of paper that says, you're not allowed to drive this fast, I ain't going to do any good to anyone. What you need is a police officer, okay, with a nice shiny car with little lights to drive behind you, make those lights shine and make a siren sound, pull you over to the side and write you a ticket. You need an officer to enforce the written law. The written law in and of itself isn't enough. Okay, I can write all the laws in the world, okay, and no one should be allowed to drive this. No, as long as it's just the law, it's of no value. What you need is an officer to enforce it. How does the officer know how to behave? What's his code of conduct? He has like an instruction manual when your first day on police officer. If you've seen the movie Police Academy, you know. Okay, join the police academy. They tell you this is how you behave. And this is what you do. And this is how your radar gun works. And this is how your baton works. And all that kind of stuff. They teach you how you should work. The law is the Bible. It teaches us what God wants. But if all you had was the Bible, it's not enough. You need the church police officer to enforce it. And how does the church operate? What's the church's code of conduct? It's tradition. It's how the church has always been operating. It's like its best practices. Okay? But it's more than that, obviously, in a divine sense. None of those three entities can stand by themselves. A police officer without the law is of no value. A code of conduct without a police officer is of no value. And a law without a code of conduct and without a police officer is, again, of no value. Okay? So church is the guardian of truth. I'm sorry, tradition is the guardian of truth. The other last thing that tradition is, is tradition is the passing on of life. Again, because Christianity is not a teaching, it is a life. Tradition originated well before Christ, <clears throat> Christ in the New Testament. It originated back in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 4. After God gave Moses all the law, and after he gave it to all the people, says, and only take heed to yourself, and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. It's not enough to just read the law. What God is commanding them to do is give this life to your kids and to your grandkids. That's what tradition is in the Orthodox Church. If you look at the life of Christ, Christ didn't write anything. But what he did is he taught. What he did is he touched what he did is he healed. What he did is he prayed. He comforted. He did lots of stuff. But he never, ever wrote down anything. So there must be more than just the writings. My role in this whole tradition business, very simple. My job is to be a living stone. Okay? I wanted to incorporate this verse ever since we came up with the name. The living stones. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also... As living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You have been given the baton. Okay? 
Your parents hopefully gave it to you. Your Sunday school teachers gave it to you. Whatever. You got the baton on the day you were baptized, and you renew it. Every time you come to this church, you take communion, you shine up your baton. You're given the baton every time you come and you hear the Word of God preached. Now it's your job to, number one, keep it, and number two, to be a living stone. Means let someone else build himself on top of you. Give it to someone else, and then let someone else build himself on top of that. Okay? That's how God's house and the, how, and the body of Christ works. It started with Christ, then he gave it to John and Peter and those guys, and then uh, St. Athanasius on top of them, and then St. Anthony on top of them, and then Pope Stephen on top of them, and now here you are. You're next in line. And then someone's going to be on top of you because you're a living stone. Okay? Let's stand up for prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father. We thank you because you gave us to be members of your household and living stones inside your body. We thank you because we were just kind of showed up and next thing we knew, we were inside your house and we were given this great baton. And we know that, that to whom little is given, little is asked, but to whom much is given, much is asked. So you've given to us a great gift. Help us to keep it. Help us to take care of it. And help us most importantly to pass it on to our brothers and our sisters, to our neighbors, our co-workers, to anyone out there because it's a shame to keep such a good thing a secret. Help us to give it to everyone around us that everyone would see your glory, see your love, see the beauty that's inside your house, that everyone would say, as Wim Shoy told us in the sermon today, that I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than, than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Pray to you, Lord, that you bless all of our gathering here. Special blessing to the entire body of Christ, our Father, Wim Shoy, to Sony Rini, and all those who asked us to pray for them. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the intercessions of our Holy Mother, St. Mary, St. Mark, all of your saints, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be